on the roof and they only have slits in the wall to shoot their bow and arrows. The house was designed to defend themselves against the foreign slave traders. The door to the compound was only two feet high. You had to crawl to get into the courtyard. So if you were the enemy, I could take your head. So when you see a people leave that, that you can go and visit now. And you see a people leave that, then you see the legacy of how they fought against slavery. You can go to Selaga. Yes, Selaga was the biggest market, okay? But at the same time, all around Selaga, we fought great wars to free our people. That's just one occasion. So history will erase the white man's mystery and let history. us learn the truth about it. History our will, li will, will liberate the white man's mystery. Mystery, yes. History will erase the white man's mystery. Wow. When we think, you know, when we pour libation, and I remember Bafo was so strong when he was the linguist for Santa Hini. Once he had, the libation had been poured, it was an affair at the stadium. I don't know whether it was the day, I was there once to see the golden stool come out, which is mm -hmm. one of the most magnificent occasion on the planet Earth. People have to, there's nothing like that, you know? But on this day, the, the, Buffalo had already poured libation. So when the president was a little bit late because of traffic and someone suggests, oh, maybe we have to pour libation for the president. Buffalo said libation is done. The law says it's done here at this time in this way. The president can take his seat. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> and the president did not feel offended because but, he knew culture reigned. Which president was that? My good brother, Jerry, who I love. Jerry. Yes. Thank you. One of, one of our great presidents. And one day, I know there have been, always been rifts between folks, but one day history would tell us that despite some of the injuries that comes with all wars or political takeover, people will die and some will be unjust and some will be just. But you've got to know who puts you back on the path. And I believe that man put us back on the path and that's why Ghana is where she is today ahead of the clan in all of Africa right now, no matter what nobody say, no one can compete with the stability, with the educational rising of Ghana. And if it wasn't for the World Bank and International Monetary Fund and the American forcing us to submit to their valuation of our currency, we'd be one of the most economically solvent country in Africa right now. So can, you break, can, you break that, can you break that part down for me? Yeah, let me go back. There was a point when the CD was almost one to one to the American dollar only a few decades ago. Yes. Now the CD is five plus something to the American dollar mm. because they came in with their austerity plan and says, you will be able to get money from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, but we, you have to allow them to reconstruct your currency. So now you're gonna devalue my currency. Now I got the gold in my ground. I got the manganese in my ground. I got the bauxite in my ground. I got the diamonds in my ground. I got the oil in my lake, but my currency get devalued. You who have none of this, your currency reigns supreme over me. I'm yeah. the only one that got things to back up my currency. And so we have to back away. The, the young people, the electorate have to tell the politicians, sit down and renegotiate these arrangements. Donald Trump, as evil as that old boy is, he showed you that he can break any treaty he want. He broke the NAFTA treaty with Canada and said you will renegotiate. He broke right. the NAFTA treaty with Mexico and said you will renegotiate. He broke the Southeast Asian treaty and said you will renegotiate. So why can't we renegotiate these colonial treaties and arrangements when a gun is being held to our head to sign them? We have more uh, rights and reason justifiably to renegotiate every single treaty, our cocoa treaty, our gold treaty, and for God's sake, that 10% oil treaty, the bauxite treaty, the manganese treaty. How can we have all this wealth and our college students is hawking on the streets selling plastic goods from China? We've got to rearrange this whole thing. We've got to revisit it. I'm not blaming 
anyone in government what britain and what the western colonial powers have done is use the world banking system world bank international monetary fund and the united nations to cripple us economically no matter how wealthy we are mm -hmm. and they control this by having us still use their filthy and i call it filthy colonial curriculas in most of our schools and so we have to raise the question if i tell the story of ghana who's the bad guy the invaders and the colonialists or my indigenous people so my brothers and sisters who are christians and i grew up in a christian church from grandpa was a christian minister when i became a muslim leader I walked away from Islam and Christianity to come back to my indigenous African religion because my grandmother was a fetish priestess, the lady who raised me. We call them root women in the South Carolina, where I come from. So I chose to go back to her path. And that led me back to Ghana, you know? And so what I asked, I asked this question. If my enemy and I are worshiping the same God, and my enemy has brought that God to me. Who do you think that God is going to serve? <laughs> I got your enemy. <laughs> There's a story when I first went to Togo, and we were having this discussion, me and um, one of the, an African Monsignor. And I was saying, why do I see all these Catholic things everywhere? And he said, oh, small. You never look up. I said, no, I ain't looking up. I don't believe in God up in the sky. He said, oh, small, you never look up. We, and I, my mind looked up all around the top part of the house with all the voodoo symbols. Down on the tables was all the Catholic symbols. But up above was all the traditional symbols. I said, oh, I got it. We can play both games if you're smart. So he told me this story. He says, you know, when the white man first came to Togo, they wanted to build this church. So they brought all the men from the village, trying to force them to work, to build this great cathedral. And our people would not work. And they just sat and laughed. And so the white man said, oh, look at those lazy Africans. They don't have sense enough to help us build a house for God. The African brother says, oh, what foolish white man to think he can build a house big enough to hold God. So, you had two philosophies just in that metaphor. But when you think of it, when you think of what makes sense, it's like the Ewe, the Ewe people use the word, they say Maui, Maui. Maui. That's, on, that's only one name. They also say Sobelisa, that the divine is the totality of creation itself. Okay, Sobelisa. That is the basis of African culture. African culture is based on mastering a knowledge of the cosmology and the ecology and the human being's relationship and role in cosmology and ecology. How do we learn the laws of nature and interpret it into our social ecology in terms of our governing characteristics? That's what we call culture. It is people's culture that saved them from genocide, not a gun. Okay, your mind keeps you from being genocided. When someone takes control, and the British made this very clear, that the only way to conquer the Africans is to destroy their access to their indigenous culture. All right, so once you cut a man off from their mind. How, how, how did they destroy that? How, what, how did they do that? Let me give you just, <clears throat> once they come in with their guns, they empower. But they say, oh, Kwamina, you want, you, you want to go to school? You want to learn science and technology and mathematics? Well, that's fine, but you can't be Kwabana anymore. You got to be John. Okay. So you leave Kwabana behind. And they tell me, oh, Kofi, you, you like to come to our school? Very fine, boy, you can come. But when I get into school, they give me a block of wood. Said if, if you speak the indigenous language, you hold that wood, but at the end of the day, you get a whipping. But if you hear another one of your brothers speaking your indigenous language, give them the wood. Whoever at the end of the day is caught with that block, that's who we whip for speaking the indigenous language. Those are just some of the tyranny used against our children. 
But then you say that your educational system is the only one that should reign. And you define my system as being fetish, juju, witchcraft. Okay. How can you say, if you go to Latte and learn the herbal system that was governed over by Nana Parabia, and I know you've heard of Nana Parabia from the Latte area. Latte. Okay. I think. Yeah. And, yeah. and I also got to know that great woman. She was a masterful. So uh, they come to Ghana now to study our herbs, to study our fauna, to find out what medication we use, bring it back to their university, study what the ingredients and components are, extract that, then sell it back to you as medicine. So if you chew this, that's bad for you. But if you take it, wrap it in my chemical sleeve called a capsule, it's good for you. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it simple, I'm trying to make it plain. The American pharmaceuticals, one year, uh, one of my brothers, who was a priest from Ghana, uh, and a Kung Fu, studying at Harvard. I went to give a lecture at Harvard. And he says, Small, I want to show you something. He was studying pharmacology. Harvard had sent him to Madagascar to get samples of all the herbs, the leaves, the berry, the fauna, everything they use for healing, everything they use for cure. Talk to the indigenous priests, find out what it's used for. Then you bring sample back to Harvard and they have them stored in a place they call the Harbarium. It's the tallest building on Harvard campus. And once they extract what's in this, they sell that formula to the pharmaceutical companies. But they learned it from you first. But they tell you, oh, that's juju. Oh, that's witchcraft. Oh, that, that's some crazy stuff. But look what happened with the pandemic. Pandemic. They said Africa is going to be decimated. Africa is going to be destroyed. Oh, yes, yes. Hey. They said a lot. Yes. But what happened? We chew our leaves. We drink our tonic. We're doing better than anybody in the world. But so they're not saying nothing. They're not saying anything now. But so, so I think I my observation, my observation is, by the time if you're born, let's say I'm using my, my myself as a certificate example. Uh, yeah. By the time you go to primary school or nursery, maybe five years, seven years there. Mm -hmm. I mean, before you go, your parents, your mother, your grandparents, they're speaking to me you know they were speaking to me i go to school because i schooled in the village you know they use the tree so it's, it's also okay mm -hmm. if you bring it forward to the cities now mm -hmm. by the time the child goes to school now she has to speak english yes by the time you're that is a conflict because when you start to speak the english <laughs> everything you have to still it, interpret it, it, it is an attack on your linguistic system yeah. by a colonizing system. It is a deliberate attack yeah. because your language carries your culture. Your language carry your spirituality. It's like when someone says, um, call someone auntie. So when people go with me, I do tours to Ghana. They say, how come everybody's calling this one auntie and this one uncle? There must be big families. I say, no, in the culture, the language describe relationships. And the relationship is, if I'm old enough to be this child's father, but I'm not the father, but I'm the uncle. Because yeah. if, if anything happened to the father, I must take that responsibility. The language explains the relationship. And that becomes a part of your behavior. You see, language also, if you look at all African language, Look at the word for person, people, place, or thing. And okay. you will find either in a suffix or prefix, their word for the divine. So what the African says in their culture is the divine is in everything. I put it in a simpler term. People get angry. I said, oh, this oh, who are you? I said, I'm God having a human experience. Oh, <laughs> this boy, he's crazy. He done lost his mind. He wants to be God, having a human experience. Let me make that simple for you. If you really want to understand African culture in a nutshell, let me say, I'll talk about Africa from America. 
Well, when I left Africa, Africa left with me. Africa is in me. The continent is my home. But all of us who left there, we took our home with us. It's in us. It's in every cell in our body. So if I'm God having a human experience, how does that make sense to a Christian and a Muslim? Break it down. I am and you are, according to African culture, and I can explain any system you want. I am an expression, as is all things in nature, of an aspect of the divine essence having this peculiar experience. No one can disprove that. Let's take it further. Our women, we know in all African culture, the women came before the man. It is only in European culture that God created some man and then took his rib and gave it to a woman. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard of. Go back as far as you can go in any African culture. It is the woman who arises first. When God, the creation, the totality of the universe, the totality of creation decided to manifest as human, it manifests as a woman. And that energy from God and that woman created the first child, which the European confused and called Jesus. Well, we were dealing with that woman and child going back in history. As far as you can go, you will see African carvings in ancient Egypt and even further back in ancient Sudan, carvings of the Holy Mother and the child. There is no Christianity yet <clears throat> for tens of thousands of years. So the European misunderstood what we were saying. Let me make that a little plain. I'm talking African culture, but I'm speaking it in English from America, right? My mother, when she gave birth to me, she gave birth to her father and, her, and herself. When my grandparents, the four of them, gave birth to my mother and father, they gave birth to themselves. If we take the gene pool back, we'll end up with God. We are all an extension of God because God is the original ancestor. When you pour libation, though we raise the cup first up and we don't pour, then we go to the sastriya and we pour the first cup and then to whatever else we want to pour. Let's be clear. Our culture understood. When we talk about a busum, Christian boys run away, Muslim boys run away. But study the abosum. The abosum are the quality and attributes of the divine itself as it manifests in nature and in things in nature, as it manifests in the cosmos. And so we study the quality and attributes of God and try to adapt them to our character. And always you have one that's more dominant than the other. With the Yorubas, they call it the Orisha. But Orishas are not gods. These are qualities and attributes of the divine that manifests itself in nature and cosmology and manifests itself in the human beings. How do you learn to develop these qualities as character so that you can build a society that reflects divinity? That's our culture. But we are afraid of it because the man who murdered our ancestors said it's bad. We are afraid of our culture because the man who raped our ancestors says it's bad. We are afraid of our culture because the people who burned our cities, burned our villages, raped our women, took them away, imprisoned others, says the way of our mothers and fathers are bad. And I'm to love the murderer more than I love my grandmother and my great father. No way. Sometimes, sometimes, what I find it difficult to understand <laughs> is I go to, say, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And I see all these statues there. All the fetish. I see all these rituals there. All the fetish, but they want to put it on us. Right? Then when I go to my village and somebody practices the same thing, the Christians will say what the other person practicing in my village is wrong. Mm. But then across the street, I go to Catholic church and I do the same thing. All the others, are, I mean, yeah. even if it's not Catholic, in the modern day, they... They, they want to impose oil. their ideology on your thoughts instead of allowing you to carry the ideology and the philosophy and the worldview of your ancestors that derives, and this is important, that derives 
from your family's historical experience and not from his family historical experience. Wow. And so that's where they change the identity. Mm -hmm. But again, we never lost it. They okay. simply interrupted. All right. I remember when the pandemic started and I called one of my younger brothers. He, he don't want me to call his name on TV because 